Hi, and welcome to the second video in our 10-year anniversary series. This one is entitled Effortless Networking for the Infinite Enterprise, Design Considerations for Fabric to the Edge. It's March 2021. Welcome spring, and welcome to all of you. I'm your host, Ed Kohler. Our agenda today is going to be fairly straightforward. We're going to talk about the challenges with today's networks. And we're going to talk about the evolution of the network and exactly what that means. We'll jump from there into fabric-based networking, and then we'll go to fabric to the edge, architecture in details. And then we'll give you a sneak peek into where we're going in the future. We here at Extreme feel that there's still too much manual configuration that has to happen. And even though many of our customers tell us that once they've installed Fabric Connect, after moving from traditional networking models, they've realized up to a 60% OPEX benefit, we still feel that there are far too many manual configuration steps that need to occur at the switch and network element level. As you will recall in our first video in our series, we demonstrated how we would automate many of these steps, such as the switch onboarding and setup, the fabric infrastructure provisioning, as well as the fabric service provisioning, and to some degree, the endpoint provisioning and policy management. And uh, if you haven't seen that video, the first in this series, please do take the time to go and review it. It's an important precedent. Now, we're not going to focus on automation here. We're really going to be talking more about the practical design constructs and what we're going to be doing in order to bring a scalable delivery of Fabric Connect to the network edge. So we hear about the concept of the evolution of the network, but what does that mean? You can see that we have discrete topologies, discrete technologies and products and even protocol architectures to uh, obtain these different network embodiments. And they're somewhat cloistered when you think about it. We, we can certainly interface from one to the other. There's no doubt about it. But there's also no doubt about the fact that these are discrete technologies and need to be treated accordingly. Well, 10 years ago, when we envisioned Fabric Connect, we viewed a single protocol architecture that could actually establish end-to-end -end connectivity. And as I've been saying for many years, when we obtain that, that goal uh, with the simplification of the protocol architecture, uh, reducing it, and then being able to extend it end-to-end, -end, well, that becomes very, very friendly to automation. And if you took a look at, again, the first video in this series, you would see that that is an actual embodiment uh, of the delivery. And we can show that this capability truly is inherently implicit into the fabric architecture. And what that means is it, it, it's embedded. The intelligence is embedded into the fabric itself. You don't need to have explicit automation tools and workflow control and, and script managers and things of that nature. Things become very, very straightforward and easy to use as a result. And we do this not through further complexity. Unlike many vendors who actually make things much more complex and add complexity for additional features that they want to bring to the table, our philosophy has always been reduced to the max. Uh, a single protocol, basically to provide all of the functions that are listed on this slide. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I will highlight IP multicast. One of the reasons being is that it is one of the contributions I made to the protocol. But I would also hi highlight layer three virtualization. And then also the concept that once we do stretch the fabric across end to end across the enterprise, we have end to end network service signaling. That lends to automation, that lends to zero touch deployment, which we saw in the previous video. And all of this can be managed through a single point of management by on-prem or cloud-based management infrastructure. So 10th year anniversary, in the comment above, a designer knows he has achieved perfection, not when there is nothing left to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. 
And I want to respond to that. And by the way, this is a very interesting individual. Uh, he was an author, actually the author of The Little Prince. He was also uh, an aviator and uh, aviation design. Uh, so this is a very pertinent statement that he makes. But what I'd like to draw a parallel to is at our 10th year anniversary, we launched a protocol architecture 10 years ago. And since then, it has received no major modifications, no major additions, just extensions. And we refer to that as an extensible protocol architecture. So we have dozens of new features to our fabric offering, but we've never had to make the protocol architecture more complex, and we've never had to add separate servers and things of that nature to provide for these end goal features. And that is a statement that's worth taking note of. So what are the benefits of an end-to-end -end fabric? Well, first of all, consistent zero-touch network deployment. When we deploy our switches, we have automated it to the point where you literally can unbox, plug it in, and walk away, which means the, the burden on the IT staff, particularly with new deployments or expansions, is drastically reduced. Consistent network access experience, which is very important for digital transformation and the digital imperative. And then simplified operations, again, a single protocol for all networking needs. Two bullets in the middle I want to highlight, being a, uh, a security guy, uh, always clean configs. This is a really, really big benefit. No lingering config fragments. Many vulnerabilities are introduced into your network security posture because of lingering configuration fragments. Things that technicians have put in for some reason or another and simply have forgotten to remove. Implicit end-to-end -end automation, next bullet. This removes the human error element. Both of these bullets are a boon to the security posture model. And then of course, the ability to reduce the network man maintenance, that brings about the OpEx benefits. Flexible topologies, we're gonna talk about that. We'll hone in onto that because we'll be talking about some design concepts. And then of course, the benefits of an end-to-end -end fabric, as we all know, is fast failure recovery, uh, far faster than any other networking technology could achieve, uh, given the service distributions, and uh, particularly for critical things like multicast or audio or video communications. So let's take a look at fabric to the edge deployment scenarios. And here we're just gonna take a look at some high level topology options that we show, uh, again, all with Fabric Connect. Uh, and there's, uh, it, while we're showing these as case point examples, if you're in one of these verticals and you don't match the example, that's not a problem. They are really only case points. There is one general theory that I would like to point out, however, is that the wider the geographic coverage of the network, Typically, the more you would gravitate towards ring-based topologies, and that's displayed by transportation and surveillance in the center, which would typically be a city, a county, a state. Healthcare is another great example where we see clusters of high densities, uh, these representing the hospitals and clinics themselves. But then we can see that because they are interconnected over perhaps a, a city, a metro, or perhaps a state, many of our healthcare networking customers uh, span multiple states in a good portion of the country. Ring-based topologies make the most sense. Education, again, um, this is pretty typical. Uh, usually it's a limited geographic coverage and uh, your high density areas would tend to be the schools and perhaps the administrative office and then you'd link them together with point-to-point -point links. Uh, hospitalities, casinos, uh, you can imagine typically would provide a very traditional, uh, you know, distribution wire closet type of model, uh, pretty much a traditional type of topology, if you will. Now, these can be mix and matched, and we'll, we'll talk about that as we move on, uh, but it's important to realize the benefit of topology independence. So let's talk about the details of the fabric to the edge architecture before we start to look at uh, in any further details in deployment, because I think this is important. 
the high level goals of all of this to begin with was not just to get fabric to the edge, but to have minimal configuration per edge switch. Ideally, uh, once an edge switch goes in, you should never have to touch it again, uh, other than you know perhaps a maintenance or console type access occasionally. But from a large degree, everything else should be done and automated as much as possible uh, within the switch configuration itself. And we saw a demonstration of that in the first video. So what I want to do now is I want to talk about you know really what we saw in that video, and then what we're going to talk about is a, uh, a diametric as far as what we're going to talk about in this video today. So here is a look at an edge switch configuration breakdown. Uh, we can see that we have our global configs that we typically have to do, our switch name, our location, our SNMP, radius server, so forth, so on. Uh, we have our infrastructure config, which is typically our interfaces and things of that nature. We have our per service attributes, our VLANs, our IP subnets, gateways, multicast, so forth, so on, DHCP relay. And then the per user, user group or user port uh, authentication. This is where we do have a lot of static entries in many instances. And then also, you know, ancillary type protocols such as BPDU guard and SOPP guard. And then of course our access control list, things of that nature. This is a pretty typical breakdown of what has to happen with an edge switch configuration as it's introduced into the network. So here, as you will recall in the first video, we demonstrated the ability to automate the global configuration, and that was applied during the onboarding to XMC XIQ. You will also recall that for the infrastructure configuration, we used AutoSense as the feature, and that was able to determine multiple modes of connectivity, ranging from direct fabric interfaces all the way to fabric attach, and even eat neat and voice type services for IP phones. We also demonstrated radius support for per user or per user group or port. And uh, we did not, well, yeah, yes, we I actually did demonstrate the ability for XMC XIQ port templates as well. What we didn't talk about in detail was DVR, distributed virtual routing and the role that it will play, particularly in the per service attributes for Fabric to the Edge. And that's really what we're going to talk about to some degree of detail here in this video. Now, as far as phase one, which takes place in VOS 8.3, you can see that we utilize DDR as the preferred Fabric to the Edge option. Now, there are other options and we'll talk about that. Uh, but this is the preferred option. And you can see that we are using DVR controllers. They are shown uh, encircled in blue at the bottom of the slide. And uh, this is really where all of our control uh, for the DVR domain takes place. And uh, if you're familiar with distributed virtual routing, then I don't need to go into detail. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail later on, uh, but right now, just be aware of the fact that the aggregation switches are the DVR controllers, and this is typically where all of the configuration would take place. The access switches, those outside of the, the blue encirclement, uh, those are the DVR leaves. Uh, ideally, you should never have to touch those. Uh, so once they go in place, everything will be controlled and commanded uh, through Extreme Cloud uh, IQ in XMC uh, via the DVR controllers itself. Multicast is configured on the DVR controllers, and there's also a feature called DVR1 IP, uh, which comes along in VOS 8.3 as well. And this basically provides a single IP address gateway uh, for all modes of communication out of the domain. Uh, and uh, this is basically where there is a termination for all of the layer three services within the network, basically the default gateway. And if you're familiar with distributed virtual routing, uh, basically that is what is presented out to the end user uh, for connectivity outside of their given network segment. 
let's look at the CLI sequence. I just want to show this, uh, realize that you wouldn't be doing this. You'd be doing all of your management through XIQ, XMC. But if you uh, wanted to uh, do a CLI, uh, here's what happens. You basically go out to the edge. You basically tell the switch it's a leaf, and then you reboot it. That's pretty much it. DDR controller, uh, a little different. Uh, we have to have per service uh, type setups uh, in, in order for clarity. We're just showing this example where we can show our ISIT, our VLAN, uh, VRF name, if appropriate, uh, obviously the IP address, the DVR gateway, uh, which will be our default gateway, and then SPB multicast if we do indeed desire it. So fairly simple setup. Again, you wouldn't do this through CLI. You would do this really through the graphical user interface of XIQ or XMC. So here is our preferred option, DDR. Uh, and we're not going to go through detail on the slide. Uh, so what we're going to do is show th the option. Now, many people uh, are a bit more traditional and aren't ready to move to DDR yet. Although I would urge you to call, talk to customers that have deployed it. Um, they will soon convince you into giving it a try at least. Many other customers can't, can't move for technical reasons. Um, so for some reason or another, they have to stick into the normal uh, routing model uh, using things like VRRP, and that's actually a secondary option for us here is we can, we can provide an additional option to run VRRP, but keep in mind that uh, uh, while we have the traditional support model, as you can see on the slides, you know, all your VLAN-based edge features are configured per switch, uh, including IP multicast, so there's a lot a lot more you know, high touch requirements to the fabric edge in order to make that occur. Now again, uh, that can happen through CLI, but it can also happen through XIQ, XMC. Uh, and this provides a good transition. So uh, the other thing I'd like to note is we do have some well-defined um, slides to show migration models. I'm not going to go into detail on that in this uh, video because it probably would take much too much time. Uh, so, uh, but do be aware of the fact that we do have some examples of how migration could occur from a traditional routing like VRRP over to DVR. So here at the close, let's do a summary of the benefits of an end-to-end -end fabric architecture. Again, consistent zero-touch network deployment, consistent network access experience, simplified operation, remember the security mantra, always clean config, and removing the human error element, true boons for the security posture of your network. Flexible topology, again, we demonstrated suitable for campus, core edge, data center, metropolitan area, and wide area networking. And again, the benefits in close for an end-to-end -end fabric is fast failure recovery, rapid failure recovery for critical connectivity services, which is very key as we move to wide area, metro area, and we start to look at the advent of smart cities and smart infrastructure. This capability is very, very key for critical communications, not only for control, but for multicast, as well as voice and video communications. Well, Thank you for your time here today. Again, 10 years of fabric innovation. I think you can see by this video and by the previous video that we are just starting. Stay tuned for more in this series. Right now, Ed Kohler signing off, inviting you to advance with us.